Our next speaker is uh, going to be uh, Professor Mohammed uh, Moti from the uh, St. Antoine Hospital, uh, whose talk, topic is going to be challenges in treatment of AML in the elderly. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Let me start first by thanking the organizers for inviting me, and it's really a great pleasure and honor to be part of this distinguished faculty. Unfortunately, the prognosis of elderly AML is rather very poor, over the, has been poor over the last 40 years, as you can see from these MRC uh, data. And uh, like Dr. Coleman, my definition for elderly AML, it's always a couple of years above the age of the boss. It's really important. Uh, in terms of uh, classification of AML, I mean, we hear a lot about uh, different classification, world, WHO, and so on. For me, it's rather straightforward. You have a small group of AML which is sensitive to conventional chemotherapy. These are the good risk patients, and they are going to be cured with chemotherapy alone. However, uh, the vast majority of AML are these patients uh, uh, which are chemo-resistant. Complete remission can be achieved, but unfortunately, uh, these patients are going to be relapsed, are not going to be cured. This is where new agents are needed, and I deeply feel uh, that allogenic stem cell transplantation remain the mainstay of therapy. When looking to the treatment of AML, whether young or elderly, but this is mainly a disease of the elderly because the median age is 67 or 68, a time of diagnosis. Beside age, one should take different parameters. You have parameters related to the disease. Of course, as a minimum is cytogenetics, but more and more, we are looking at molecular uh, profiles. And uh, although this is more difficult than in ALL, MRD is going to become more and more important. However, we should not neglect, and this is really uh, valid, in the so-called elderly population to look at the patient disease features, performance status, comorbidities, but more and more with all these new drugs, we should pay attention to pharmacogenetics because the tolerance and toxicity profile may be different from, uh, from one place to another. Looking at the treatment of elderly AML, this is a, a nice registry-based uh, study from Sweden. Sweden is a rather relatively small country, 10 million people, where they have a very nice registry, and they have been collecting data on any kind of cancer. And in the case of AML, they could show, for example, irrespective of age, that the percentage of early deaths after diagnosis is always higher when you use palliative care versus intensive care. Of course, one should be cautious. This is uh, more than a 35 years registry. Comorbidities uh, were not available. Cytogenetics were not available. And we don't know if this is true at the era of novel agents. However, this is a quite a nice suggestion, and I personally believe in this, that intensive chemotherapy, whenever feasible, should be the treatment and first option in uh, this group of patients. We heard a lot about many novel agents. This is just a small uh, summary of the most promising flat free inhibitors, and I will present this during the AML workshop later on today. Hypomethylating agents, some promising data, and some very nice data coming from the use of gemtuzumab and DCD33. Uh, you probably have seen this randomized trial from the uh, Alpha uh, intergroup in France, age 50 to 70, so a sort of an overlap between young and uh, elderly patient. And this is rather simple, uh, phase three randomized, three plus seven versus pre three plus seven plus gemtuzumab at low dose, three milligram meter square, day one, day four, and day seven. And interestingly, there was a significant advantage in terms of event-free survival in favor of the gemtuzumab arm 
And this is also true when looking to uh, overall uh, survival. So definitely the use of gemtuzumab as part of the induction therapy in this group of patients may be useful, and this may become a standard of care uh, in the near future. And you have probably seen this editorial by many uh, AML specialists asking to resurrect uh, gemtuzumab. Epigenetic therapy, uh, two agents are currently available, 5-Aza and Decitabin. The data in elderly AML uh, with 5-Aza is derived from this Aza001 trial, which included both myelodysplastic syndromes, but also a small group of AML because the study was designed at a time where the definition was 30% of blast. So you have 113 patients between 20 and 30% of blast who were included in this trial. And uh, uh, I think many people are familiar with these results showing clearly a significant survival advantage in favor of the azacitidine arm. An important message from this trial is that for the first time, as far as I know, that this survival advantage is not correlated with the CR rate, which may suggest that maybe we are now having some novel mechanism of action with these new drugs different from the cytotoxic therapy we are uh, all familiar with. This is more recent data from Decitabin. Decitabin has just been approved in Europe for the treatment of elderly AML. This is an international randomized trial comparing Decitabin to best available care. And again, there is a significant survival advantage in favor of the Decitabin arm. Of course, you may question whether this is really significant because at some point, uh, like two years later, after uh, follow-up, after diagnosis, the difference is rather very mild. Nevertheless, these were heavily... Um, these were elderly patients over the age of 65 with lots of comorbidities, so it may be a, a good option. Clofarabin has been mentioned. This is another important player in the field. It has been tested by different investigators as a single agent with rather fair uh, response rate between 30 to 40 percent. And once again, you have probably seen this uh, paper from Alan uh, Burnett in the UK group in a group of patients where the median age was 71 years with 30% of advanced risk cytogenetics, you may achieve up to 50% CR rate when using a clofarabin-based regimen. Of course, future is for combination. Clofarabin has been combined with RSC, again, with some interesting and decent data. Uh, for the sake of time, I will not enter into the detail, but also uh, the qu next question may be, why not combining with anthracycline? I think the most important part, and we all agree that none of these agents that I have cited and that were cited by the previous speaker, none of these drugs will ever cure any AML patient. And the most powerful uh, anti-leukemia agent remain the immune-mediated uh, allogenic effect. And we all know from uh, the uh, old studies in the field of uh, allogenic stem cell transplantation that those patients who are going to have some mild, moderate, chronic GVHD are going to enjoy long-term survival. And this is the reason why the allogenic stem cell transplant activity has been steadily increasing in AML with first CR, but also in AML beyond first CR. And this is important when we look now at the registry. There's a huge number of patients who are offered allogenic stem cell transplant in, a, in relapse or refractory disease because allogenic stem cell transplant, based on the available data, is going to achieve better results than what you can achieve with any phase one single agent. And this increase is mainly due 
to the introduction of the so-called reduced intensity or reduced toxicity conditioning regimen, but also the use of alternative donors, cord blood and haplo, so almost every patient can have a donor these days. Looking at the reduced intensity conditioning regimen, because I don't personally feel that there is room for standard myeloablative conditioning when it comes to elderly AML. You have several choices. Of course, one of the uh, popular regimens uh, in many places is a flu low-dose TBI2 gray. The results were published here, the AML experience published in JCO three years ago. I personally don't think that this is an optimal regimen because when it comes to uh, AML, this is a group of uh, highly chemosensitive diseases and you may wish to have some chemotherapy, some myeloablation as part of the conditioning regimen while waiting to the immune graft versus leukemia effect. Another important feature with flu TBI2 gray is that toxicity is rather very low early after transplant, but then if you follow up the patient long enough, then the transplant-related mortality is going to be around 20%. So definitely, it's a low-dose TBI, but toxicity is similar to what you would expect with other chemotherapy-based regimen. Our favorite regimen has been, for the last 12 years, is a combination of fludarabine, busulfan, and thymoglobulin uh, ATG. And we've been working on this uh, combination now with several hundreds of patients, trying to play with the dose of busulfan, one, two, three, or four doses. First, we started with oral busulfan, and now we're using IV busulfan, and a fixed dose of thymoglobulin. And I will give you just a quick hint about the results. This is the first series we have published more than seven years ago with a median follow-up in elderly AML, more than five, median follow-up, five years, 60 months, donor versus no donor. To make a long story short, there is a clear advantage on an intention to treat a basis to offer reduced intensity conditioning to these patients. We are further, these were, these, this was a conditioning with fludarabine, two doses of busulfan, 6.4 milligram per kilo uh, total dose, and thymoglobulin, 5 milligram per kilo total dose, given 2.5 milligram per kilo per day at day minus one and day minus two. We are trying further to improve these results, and recently we completed this analysis, increasing the dose of busulfan to three doses. This is what I call the FB3 regimens, and uh, I am showing you here the first analysis from this, and with this kind of regimen, you can achieve a relatively low long-term transplant-related mortality, 10% at, at 12 months and 12% at two years. For the sake of time, these are the, my conclusions. AML therapy remains nonspecific and challenging for most patients. We need to take into account many demographic features, but also more and more the molecular features, and a multi-agent approach is needed. One must acknowledge that we have lots of emerging and promising and exciting therapies, however, Allogenic stem cell transplantation will remain the recommended treatment for many patients. Reduced toxicity conditioning is, appears to be safer procedure and is feasible, including in the very uh, old patient. And I believe that the results of reduced intensity and reduced toxicity conditioning will be further improved by the use of uh, uh, immunomodulation and maintenance uh, therapy after allogenic stem cell transplantations that will be addressed in the next talk. With this, thank you very much for your attention.